particles in the water than you could get from unpolarized light. Unfortunately, the satellite only lasted about six months before it died, but people are now getting interested in polarization, and with some luck, a couple of years down the road, I may have hydrolite upgraded to have a polarized version, but right now it's all unpolarized. So I just want to say a little bit about polarization. We're not going to play with it much in this class, but it is important. Okay, another problem with radiance is there's so much information there that it's hard to even draw a plot of it. So let me just now show you some plots and raise some questions. Uh, radiance is four variables. So here's one where I've plotted just selected depths and I'm plotting it as wavelength uh, versus depth for, um, for one particular direction. So the downwelling radiance, so that means uh, here it's the radiance that's, that's, the light is going downward. If I were in the water, I would be looking upward to measure the downwelling radiance. Now we'll also refer frequently to the upwelling radiance, so I'm in the water now looking downward, measuring the radiance coming upward. I'll just raise a question here. Here's the plots at different depths. The black line is what I measured in the air, so I'm looking upward. I'm just above the surface. I measure, you know, looking at this patch of sky. Now I go just below the surface, still looking upward, and I go down to deeper and deeper depths. Notice something kind of weird. Just below the surface, so zero depth means I'm just below the surface. 10 meters, I'm now 10 meters down. Notice that the downwelling radiance is bigger in the water than it was in the air. So that sounds kind of strange. You know, if we have energies conserved, part of this downwelling sky radiance is going to be reflected by the surface. So it looks like I ought to have less in the water than I had above the surface if parts reflected. So I get a lot of questions from people saying, well, hydrolite's got to be wrong. It doesn't conserve energy because I'm getting a bigger radiance in the water than I had in the air. And I have to say, it's the law of conservation of energy, not the law of conservation of radiance. Just keep that in mind. We'll talk about that more later. Also notice, up here, there's no little bumps. And then you get down 50, 100 meters, you start getting these weird little bumps out here. So what causes those? Well, you'll learn as the class goes on. That's actually fluorescence by chlorophyll. And here's another plot of radiances. Now this is at one wavelength and plotting things as a function of depth for a few different viewing directions. So here's the downwelling or the zenith viewing. That's the purple curve. Here's the upwelling, or the nadir viewing radiance. And then here's three horizontal radiances, and I'm looking in the direction towards the sun, right angles to the sun, and away from the sun if I'm underwater. Well, notice some peculiar things. Here's this zenith viewing radiance. is some value at the surface, <coughs> and it gets bigger for a while, and then it starts decreasing. <clears throat> Seems kind of strange because as the light propagates through the water, at least some of it should be absorbed. So how could the radiance get bigger as you go down with depth? I'll just pose that as a question and leave you hanging. But hopefully in a couple of weeks, you'll understand what's going on here. The answer has to do with scattering. Okay, there's just another plot. Now this time... I'm plotting as a, viewing, a function of the viewing direction, theta. Notice I've got theta sub v here versus wavelength at a given depth of 10 meters. And it's a slice through, it says, in the phi plane of the sun. So if the projector is the sun, I'm going to look in this direction here, and I'm going to plot things as a function of theta around this way, and then a function of wavelength. So... I'm looking, and also remember my coordinate system, I'm going to pick z to be positive downward, and theta is measured from the positive z-axis. So theta equals zero is photons going downward, 
theta is 90, and theta 180 is photons going upward. But I plotted this as viewing direction, so that's 180 degrees off. The viewing direction of 180 is the light going straight down, meaning so I'm looking straight up. You just have to get used to these kind of plots and you kind of sort of stop and look at them. Okay, enough said there. I'm running out of time for my 1030 stop here, so let me go ahead and proceed. And there's more things here. Uh, here I am in the air. I'm looking upward at the sun. Down here, a, as it comes down, here's a big bump here. Well, I've come from looking straight upward, looking out, seeing the sun, looking to 90 degrees, and then looking down, and this big bump here is the sun being reflected off of the sea surface. Okay, here's another plot now. One wavelength, one depth, all thetas and phis. So I'm looking up at the sun, and then I'm looking down at the reflection of the sun off of the sea surface for a level surface. Just a different way of plotting it, and then the magnitude is done by the color. Okay, to get on with it, if we, uh, in another 10 minutes here, to finish up, I have my radiance instrument. It has the Gaussian tube, which gives me a solid angle. Just take the Gaussian tube off, and now I have a little instrument measuring <coughs> the light that comes in now from any direction in the half plane because I don't have the tube there. And that gives me what's called the planar radiance. So that's the most commonly measured thing. The idea is that the surface here is equally sensitive to light coming from any direction. But of course, if I have an instrument, let's, you know, here's my detector. If I look at it from straight on, I see a big detector. If I look at it out here, it looks smaller. And if I look at it <coughs> at 90 degrees, it looks like it's zero detecting area. <coughs> so really, the size of the detector here seen by light coming in at different directions is proportional to the cosine of theta. It's just the projection of the full size, full area onto a plane of the light coming in from the side. So when I make the measurement, I simply take my instrument, I put it out there, light comes from all directions, and I get a number. I get how much energy is detected per unit time for the area of the detector for whatever the wavelength is. So the irradiance is watts per square meter per nanometer. That's the spectral irradiance. Spectral meaning per unit of wavelength. If I want to compute the irradiance given the radiance, well, I can integrate over theta equals zero out to pi over two and over all azimuthal directions. So I take the radiance but now I have to weight it by the cosine of theta because that's describing the projected area of my detector. So when I measure it, you just get what you measure. When you want to compute it, it's radiance weighted by cosine integrated over all the solid angles. So there's our little element of solid angle, sine theta d theta d phi, integrated from theta equals 0 to pi over 2 and phi equals 0 to 2 pi. So in hydrolyte, for example, it computes the radiance, and then it solves the radiative transfer equation, gets this, and then it computes the irradiances using that equation. Okay, so that's the plane irradiance, plane because the detector is a flat surface. And, you know, it, if you plot it, it sort of looks kind of like those radiance distributions, except the magnitudes are different and the units are different. And I'll also point out, you will never ever see me put up a plot that doesn't have the axes labeled with the units. Makes a big difference, you have to get the units. Okay, here's some peculiar things. <clears throat> here's some irradiances plotted as a function of depth for selected wavelengths. Notice here the one at 455, it starts out with a value near the surface and 
it just continues to decrease with depth. So, you know, at that wavelength, if I have my sensor and I just sink into the water, it gets darker and darker and darker as measured by the downwelling plane irradiance. Some weird things start happening at other wavelengths. You know, notice how these wavelengths are decreasing very quickly with depth, but then they end up bending around and they decrease at the same slope as the blue curve here. So something kind of strange going on there. You can kind of just tuck that away as saying, I have no idea what's happening here. It doesn't make sense that some of the wavelengths sort of behave like I would expect. It gets darker as you go down. Some get darker very fast, but then very slowly. So tuck that away as a mystery to be solved. Next thing to do is scalar irradiance. Now I have an instrument that's equally the same size. It's a little ball. Think of a little ping pong ball. So it doesn't matter what direction I look at it. It's the same projected area. So that's called a spherical detector. And I'm going to put a block here so that only light that's coming from downward can be detected and light that's coming upward will be blocked from hitting my instrument. And I get what's called, if it's pointed upward, I'm going to get the downwelling scalar irradiance. So once again, it's energy per unit time, or, uh, yeah, energy per unit time per unit area of the detector per uh, unit wavelength. So it's the same units as plane irradiance, but it's going to have a different magnitude. It's going to be a bigger number than plane irradiance because the detector always has the same projected area. And if I'm going to compute this from the radiance, I just integrate the radiance over all directions. There's no cosine weighting factor there because it always looks like the same area delta A. So that's the scalar irradiance. That's important. It's very fundamental to photosynthesis calculations and water heating because the phytoplankton doesn't care whether the photon was going this direction or this direction, it's equally likely to get absorbed and lead to photosynthesis. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip the vector part here, but I will comment briefly on intensity, which we'll need next week for talking about volume scattering functions. If I have a point source, and I just think of how much energy is going out from this point source into some solid angle, in some little wavelength range, then the intensity is the energy per unit, per unit time, per unit solid angle, per unit wavelength range. So intensity is watts per square, per steradian. There is no per square meter per nanometer. Point of confusion. This is what physicists call intensity. If you go to the atmospheric optics world, they call radiance intensity. So it's very confusing. And there's even a physics paper that a guy published that said, I sure wish everybody would start using the word intensity correctly. It should never mean anything except watts per steradian per nanometer. It's a fun, fun little article with this guy on his rant about how people misuse the word. OK, scalar irradiance is important for photosynthesis because the photons or the phytoplankton don't care what direction the light is going, but phytoplankton don't care about the energy that was absorbed. They care about how many photons I absorbed. And the reason is if the phytoplankton absorbs a photon, a blue photon or a green photon can lead to the same amount of photosynthesis. Now, it may be less likely to absorb a green one or a blue one, but if it's absorbed, it has the same physiological end result. So the biologists like to work with uh, scalar irradiance, and they want to know the number of photons. So we take the energy unit divided by hc over lambda. That's energy per photon, remember? Or e naught times lambda over hc. You integrate over all the wavelengths, and you get how many photons there were per second per square meter. So that's photosynthetically available radiation. And of course, we've already seen there's a huge number of photons. So 
PAR, which is integrated 400 to 700 nanometers, that's what most people use in biology still today, rather than saying, oh, there's 10 to the 19th or 10 to the 20th photons per square meter per second, they define an Einstein as one mole of photons, Avogadro's number of photons, and then they give PAR as a number like micro Einsteins per square meter per second. So you'll get used to those units. Um, okay, I already gave you some warnings on terminology like the atmospheric people call radiance intensity and they call irradiance flux. And then some people call flux flux density, and then you go to the medical field and they talk about fluence and fluence rates. They're all just irradiances, but every field here has developed its own terminology and its own notation, and they're all doing the same problem underneath, the same math. They just call everything by different words, and it's extremely confusing. Um, so I'll also warn you, people use the word spectral to sometimes they mean as a function of wavelength, or spectral can mean per unit wavelength interval. They're not really the same thing. Uh, so spectral downwelling plane irradiance, ED, is per unit wavelength interval. So as we saw, watts per square meter per nanometer. A lot of papers, they'll say, oh, we measured the irradiance and the number was 400. Papers rejected if I'm doing, reviewing it. I don't know if that was 400 watts per square meter per nanometer or whether it's 400 watts per square meter over a wavelength range of, say, 410 to 420 nanometers. So I'm always very careful to say band integrated radiance. So I've integrated over wavelength and the number is so many watts per square meter or Am I talking about the spectral quantity and the number is watts per square meter per nanometer? You have to get those straight or your life will just be complete misery when you go to look at data. So when you have an instrument and you go out and it says, I measure the irradiance and the number comes out and it's 100, you have to know, is that instrument giving you the band integrated radiance <coughs> and it it was 100 watts per square meter over the wavelength range from 400 to 420. Or did the instrument maker divide that by the bandwidth of 20 nanometers and his instrument is giving you then a spectral irradiance? So watts per square meter per nanometer. And I quite often have people trying to compare instrument values with what they computed in hydrolyte and they don't agree. And I say, well, you sent me this spreadsheet that has your irradiance values. There's no units there. So how do I know? Is it some people use watts per square meter per nanometer. Some people might use milliwatts per square centimeter per micrometer. You know, how am I supposed to know how these things are comparing with hydrolyte when your spreadsheet doesn't have the units shown? And you know what the answer will be when I say, what are the units of column two in your spreadsheet? You know what the answer is? I don't know. I'll have to check with my technician. That guy is not a good scientist. You know, if you have an instrument and you don't know what the units are coming out of that instrument, you're not in league with the people in this class. So then they go off and they check and they say, oh, well, my technician said it was milliwatts per square centimeter per micrometer. And I say, oh, well, okay, plug in. Hydrolyte's putting out these units. Your units are different by a factor of 10. There's your factor of 10 difference in why your instrument numbers don't agree with hydrolyte. They say, oh, thank you. You know, and I've now spent like eight hours dealing with this guy. Okay, so always show the instrument units, or show the units and always understand what units your instrument is actually putting out. Okay, I'm using up Collins' time here. End of view graph. Uh, I always finish my lectures with a pretty picture so you have something to look forward to while you're sitting through my long-winded conversations. Well, I do a lot of sea kayaking. A couple of years ago, I had to go down to Panama, and so here's 
here's Panama, here's the Panama Canal, here's Panama City, Cologne on the Caribbean side. I figured out there are these Indians called the Cunas. They were never conquered by the Spaniards, you know, going back to the days of Balboa and all of those guys. And the reasons were twofold. The Cunas don't have any gold, so the Spanish lost interest in them. And the Cunas love to stick poison arrows into Spaniards. So the Spaniards just decided, let's just leave these guys alone and let them be. And right up until today, the Cunas have never been under the control of Panama. They have their own little autonomous region. They, <clears throat> they get to run their, run their own lives. They don't pay Panamanian taxes. They don't vote in Panamanian elections. They're just sort of off there, technically in Panama, but really running their own thing. So anyway, I had to go down there with some friends, and we flew into Panama City. We caught a little plane over to a little dirt runway here, and then we spent six or eight days kayaking back past these little islands like this, of which there's hundreds of little islands right off the coast here. And you can see there's a little grass hut here and a couple of blue tarps here. The Kunas run a, a, a collective society where each family is assigned an island, and then you get to collect the coconuts on your island and sell those, and that's your income. And you get this island for three or four years, and then they all trade around so nobody gets a good island and somebody else is stuck with a bad island. And so the local Kunas will be happy to have the gringos like me stop by and camp on their island, and they charge you about $5 a night to camp there, and that's worth a, a whole lot of coconuts for $5. And, of course, they're happy to feed you some fish for another dollar. And so I do something like this every year, uh, have some big kayaking adventure in some exotic place, and you'll see more pictures of that in the future. But right now, let's take 10 minutes, and then Colin's on. Is that, does that work for you, Colin? Yeah, let's, let's take uh, 15 minutes, maybe. Okay, let's yeah, it's 10. That, that won't run us too far past dinner because I've 